All right, hello, hello, everyone, and welcome back to lesson two of the new study design for VCE Economics, Unit 3, Area Study 1, Microeconomics. Today, we're going to be looking at relative prices, perfect competition, and types of efficiency. So these are all things that were in the previous study design. What is new with them in this study design is that we are going to be tying in some of the types of efficiency with the production possibility frontier, which we hadn't had to do previously. So we're going to talk about how allocative efficiency, technical efficiency, dynamic efficiency, and intertemporal efficiency all can relate to the production possibility diagram as well. Because that comes up in the key knowledge that we'll be looking at today, which is these four dot points, which are the meaning and significance of economic efficiency, including allocative efficiency, productive efficiency, dynamic efficiency, and intertemporal efficiency, and their relationship to the PPF model, the conditions for a free and perfectly competitive market, the role of relative prices in the allocation of resources, and the role of free and competitive markets in promoting an efficient allocation of resources and improved living standards. We're kind of pulling a couple of key knowledge dot points from lower in the study design because they marry up nicely with these ones. So we might as well do them together. So we get to our learning intention, which for all of this unit is to understand how resources are allocated in Australia. Now, success criteria today is that you can explain how relative prices impact resource allocation for both businesses and consumers. You can outline the features of a perfectly competitive market and you can distinguish between different types of efficiency and potentially relate them to the PPF model. So relative prices are all about the comparison of selling prices between two similar goods or services. So the prices of products relative to other products is a very simple way to put it in. So relative is really, really important there. So when relative prices change, it sends clear signals to producers and consumers and therefore can change resource allocation and means that businesses will redirect resources towards their most profitable use. So because the comparison of selling price between two similar goods or services, that really is going to impact businesses. It still costs the same to produce them despite the selling price potentially changing. So for example here, if apples and oranges both had a sale price of $2, it wouldn't matter which one the businesses produce because they both are at the same level of profit because they cost the same to produce. But if the sale price of apples increased to $3, all of a sudden, producers would redirect their resources into producing apples or into apple production because they're now more relatively profitable. And that is really, really important for businesses because they are always going to want to produce what is going to make them the most profit overall. Whereas for consumers, it's a little bit different. Now for consumers, oranges have gotten relatively cheaper and to maximize their utility, consumers are more likely to direct their resources towards producing and purchasing and consuming oranges. So that's relative prices. So the role of relative prices in allocating resources. So relative prices are the final price of a particular good or service compared to another. Relative profits compare profits gained from producing one good in comparison to another. So that's like we were saying before, if apples are now relatively more profitable because they have a higher selling price, businesses are going to redirect or reallocate their resources towards producing apples because they're going to make more profit from that. So since business owners are motivated by profit, they may end up moving resources from one industry, for example, wool, to another, like wheat, reflecting the re relative changes in profitability of one product against another. So businesses are always going to reallocate resources towards whichever is relatively profitable, and consumers are always going to reallocate their resources towards whichever is going to maximize the utility or whatever is cheaper. So then we get into the nature and types of efficiency. So We've got four main types of efficiency that we're going to look at in VC economics, and they're all really important. You need to be able to distinguish between them, but also give examples of how they can be achieved. Um, and also kind of, yeah, give examples of what the government can do to try and make us more of that type of efficiency. So allocative efficiency will occur when the allocation of resources chosen maximizes society's well-being. It occurs when there's no shortages or surpluses of certain goods or services. It's the only combination of production where the living standards are maximized. And it can be illustrated on the production possibility diagram. It's at any point along this curve is considered allocatively efficient because at any point along this curve, we are using our resources to maximize production and therefore hopefully maximize living standards. It's gonna to lead to the lowest rates of unemployment and also the most goods and services produced to society, and therefore it's going to maximize well-being. So anywhere along that curve is allocatively efficient. Then we've got technical efficiency. Technical efficiency is all about producing at the lowest cost for the maximum output. So it's the point in production where 
productivity is at a maximum and where average costs are at a minimum. So it's not possible to increase output without increasing inputs. This can be achieved through things like education and training, new technology, um, anything where businesses are able to decrease their costs and maximize their output. So once again, any point along the proximal possibility curve is technically efficient because all along that curve, businesses are maximizing their output and not having any waste. Then we have dynamic efficiency. Dynamic efficiency is all about how quickly an economy can reallocate to achieve allocative efficiency. What that means is how fast businesses can change their production to match society's changing needs and wants. So if society goes from demanding coal power to demanding solar power or solar energy, businesses being able to see that and changing, reallocating their resources to change production is going to be dynamically efficient because they're going to match up with what society needs and wants. So on this PPF, it would mean how quickly a business might be able to move from, say, for example, point B to point D, because now that is the combination of resources that businesses or consumers are demanding. So then we have intertemporal efficiency, which is the last one we're going to look at. Intertemporal efficiency focuses on balancing the allocation of resources between different time periods, usually now and the future. So economists are increasingly concerned about how resources are managed not only for now, but for future generations, because we need to satisfy their needs and wants as well. So on the PPF, producing at point X without increasing our capacity would be unsustainable for future generations. And this would be really, really bad. So we need to be able to find out ways to be able to produce at that point without it being negative for society. So we want to be able to increase the curve out to that point through the things like we mentioned in the previous lesson, education and training, new technology, et cetera, which increases our productive capacity and therefore will make us more intertemporally efficient because we're balancing the use of our resources between different time periods. And then the last thing we're gonna look at today is perfect markets or perfect competition. So a market in economics is any type of arrangement that facilitates the exchange of goods and services between buyers and sellers. So the market structure that forms the basis of the supply and demand diagrams that we'll be learning about in the next lesson and onwards, which looks like this, is called perfect competition. And it has three conditions that exist for it to exist. So when there is perfect competition, there are many buyers and sellers. Products are homogenous or there's no product differentiation. This means that every product is the same no matter who you buy it from. So if you buy a potato, you can buy it from any seller selling potatoes because that type of potato is the same. And there is ease of entry and exit. It means there's low startup costs and it's easy to get into that industry or get out of that industry if you no longer want to work in it. So if you want to grow fruit and vegetables, you can just grow them if you have land. And because the products are homogenous, there's no branding or anything associated with that. So it makes it easy to enter that market and be competitive if you're able to minimize your production costs. So in addition, perfectly competitive markets is based on the following assumptions. We assume that buyers and sellers operate with full information and make rational choices. What that means is that you're going to try and find the lowest prices and highest quality. You're not just going to buy from the first um, vendor that you see. We also assume that resources are mobile and will be reallocated to whatever is most beneficial. So if a product is not profitable or consumers do not want a product, you're, we're assuming that businesses aren't going to keep producing that. They'll reallocate it towards what society actually is demanding. And we also assume that businesses aim to maximize profits and consumers aim to maximize utility. So we assume that consumers are always going to try and find the lowest price and businesses are always trying to do whatever they can to lower their costs to maximize their profits. So perfect markets should lead to increased levels of efficiency as businesses have to produce the lowest possible price to remain competitive. This should also lead to increased living standards as consumers have access to cheaper goods and services overall. This is really, really great overall. So perfect markets should lead to technical efficiency being achieved as businesses have to cost cut as much as possible to maintain their competitive edge in their market to remain as profitable as possible. And that is the end for lesson two for Area Study 1 Microeconomics. I hope this has been helpful. If you have any questions about any of these things, as always, just shoot a comment below or email me, sean at therunningeconomy.com. Um, and we're doing videos for all of these. The next few videos are exactly the same as the old study design, so they're just gonna sit in the playlist as they were previously. Um, but other than that, I hope you have a wonderful day and I will see you next time. Goodbye.